Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Gregor Reed, and welcome to the Minister's Digital Series Minister's Conference uh, Planning for Climate Change. Um, we've got a couple of great speakers lined up for you today, and I'm going to give you a quick um, introduction uh, presentation, a few short videos, and then we're going to get right into the um, presentations. Um, this one house cleaning item. Uh, earlier descriptions did mention that there was going to be discussion on green technology. Um, unfortunately, we don't have anybody speaking directly to that. Um, so if you did uh, show up for that, my apologies, but uh, there's still lots of great relevant information about uh, climate change and how it uh, uh, can impact us here in Nova Scotia and, um, and uh, options for adaptation. So I'm just gonna get, uh, get started right here and um, a quick video to share from the message from the minister. Welcome to our session called Planning for Climate Change. Climate change is a very serious issue for all of us, especially in the fishing industry. You see the water temperatures increasing all the time and we're worried about what could happen to our stocks, where the stocks will move, if indeed they move, or may even help bring in new species. I'm excited too today about the expert panel we have assembled. This is a very important topic to all of us. And we can tell by the registration, a tremendous number of people have signed up for this. We're excited about that and excited to see that we can build more partnerships to address this serious, serious issue. I want to thank uh, Farm Credit Canada and the Nova Scotia Fisheries and Aquaculture Loan Board and the Association, the Aquaculture Association of Nova Scotia for the participating this year again with the Minister's Conference on uh, Fisheries. It's the 23rd year this year. I started this program in 1998 few fishermen to see if we can make some change. Wonderful to see has continued all this time and last year we had the biggest attendance in history and I can't wait to get back and have it in person again. Hopefully COVID will be over this time next year to a point that we can have a major meeting again and see you all there. So thank you for attending today. Thank you to our sponsors and to the presenters. I'm sure there'll be a great exchange of ideas and ideas we can help you implement. Have a great day. Thank you. That was Nova Scotia Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture, Keith Caldwell. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, message, Mr. Caldwell. A couple of housekeeping items for the use of Zoom. All participants will have their audio and video turned off during the webinar, please. If you would like to ask a question, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If preferred, you may also ask a question in the chat function of the webinar. Uh, we'll try to monitor that as best we can. Uh, the chat and QA, Will be monitored throughout the session and addressed during the live Q&A session happening at the end of the presentation. Um, so instead of having questions at the end of each presentation, all the panelists are going to remain till the end of the session and then we're going to have um, opportunities for questions after that. Um, our sponsors for the presentations, uh, uh, Farm Credit Canada and the Nova Scotia Fisheries and Aquaculture Loan Board. Just a little bit of a plug here. Um, since 2019, FCC is involved in seafood processing. Um, so that's a fairly uh, new thing for them, and their website's pretty easy to remember. It's fcc.ca. And we're also sponsored by the Nova Scotia Fisheries and Aquaculture Loan Board, and we have a short uh, video message from them. Fisheries and Aquaculture Loan Board provides financing for fishers and for businesses, um, for folks wanting to enter the industry, for new entrants, um, and, and really anyone who doesn't have um, the ability to get financing through a, a traditional commercial bank. We really are here to support the fisheries and aquaculture industry, and we really want to have a vibrant um, rural community in Nova Scotia. I've known of the Fish and Loan Board pretty well ever since they've been in business. I've been working personally with them since 2000, so 21 years. To have the same clients coming back because they put their faith in us to be able to finance their projects, to be able to help them through whatever they're going through. There's difficult times sometimes in the industry and we're here to support them and work through it with them. They know the industry. They're a fisherman's loan board. They know the fishermen, they know the industry. You get to know the fishermen, you know their families, you talk to them, you know how their businesses work, and to see them succeed is, is 
is what we're there for. It's really fantastic to hear the success stories, um, to, to be able to go out and see their enterprises and what they're, they're building and, and what they have brought back to their communities. We have long-term interest rates, which really help the fisher. It lowers their payments. We support them from the beginning of their start in the industry right through to existing fishers who are looking to buy new boats, new licenses. Whatever we need, uh, they will talk to us, and if they can help us, they will. When you have a young fisher who has worked on the back of the boat, they've saved their money for a deposit, they apply to the board, it's their dream to own their own fishing enterprise and when their loan gets approved, to see them start their career in the fishing industry, it's very rewarding. Thanks for that update from one of our sponsors. And it's also brought to you by Anovasi. One more video. The ocean is a very unexplored place. And there's, there's a lot of questions right now. There's a lot of fish stocks that are in trouble as far as we can tell. So being able to take measurements of salinity, of ocean temperature, of oxygen levels, of all sorts of different metrics like that is going to be really helpful for both scientists and aquaculture. Instrumentation on a farm supports better understanding the environment in which the fish is in, the stresses that the fish may be seeing. That coupled with optimal feeding enables a minimal environmental impact. On the side of the farmers, they have livestock that they're trying to manage and make decisions about. Feed levels, position of the farm in the water column. The customer can decide what metrics they're looking to track very close to in real time. That communicates with a number of our other products as well as the cloud. All right. And just, um to introduce our session panelists for today. Uh, their biographies are on the website, but um, just quickly, uh, Dr. Blair Greenan from Fisheries and Oceans Canada. He's gonna be speaking about uh, climate change and coastal adaptation. Uh, Dr. Kathy Mills from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. She's gonna be speaking about marine fisheries and a warming ecosystem, climate impacts and adaptation. And Jenny Corris from Anoasi, she's gonna be talking about harmful algal blooms and aquaculture. And just to plug for some upcoming sessions, uh, marine debris is on April 8th, on Thursday, options to address an evolving issue. We have improving quality and best practices in the live lobster industry, Thursday, April 15th, and the Minister of Seafood and Sport Fish Industry Awards are on April 22nd. So that's it for our introductory material. Um, well, we have three panelists. Um, I'm also gonna do a presentation. Um, my name is Gregor Reed. I'm the director of the Center for Marine Applied Research. And I'm just going to share my screen here. If you'll just uh, bear with me for a moment. We've got it going here. Okay. Let's see if I can get this right here. It worked great for the trial run. Let me share. There we go. I'm guessing our, our technical person will step in if it's not being shared. I see expressions of acknowledgement. So I think that that's on there. So um, talks are roughly 15 minutes. Uh, once again, opportunities for, um, for questions at the end of the sessions, we'll probably have about um, uh, 15 or 10 minutes for questions um, at the very end. And all the panelists, including myself, will be staying on. Um, so since our panelists are getting into some very sort of um, uh, specific areas, um, I thought I'd cover kind of a larger big picture overview. Um, so I call my talk climate change, sorting the big picture for fisheries and aquaculture. Um, got maybe two heavy data slides, but then the rest is more, uh, more high level 10,000 foot uh, view on this. So, um, most of us are pretty aware now the uh, implication climate change has globally. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the climate change threatens our ability to ensure global food security, eradicate poverty, and achieve sustainable development. That's a pretty big statement. Um, and if we look at fisheries globally, 
Uh, captured fisheries and aquaculture provide 3 billion people with 20% of their average per capita intake of animal protein, and an additional 1.5 billion people with about 15% of their animal protein in total. So it's a large uh, you know, contribution to nutrition on the global stage. Seafood is the most highly traded food globally, and demand is only expected to increase. Good news for Nova Scotia, just since we rely heavily on seafood export. We have a lot at stake here. Over 70% of Nova Scotia's population live within 20 kilometers of the coast, and 14% of all jobs in the province are ocean-related. So what do we need to do to understand how climate change is impacting our ocean-dependent sectors, communities, and take action? Before we get to that, just a little bit of climate 101 here, and uh, many of you are familiar uh, with this, so in, in that case, it might just be a reminder. Emissions equal climate change. So we don't need to get into too much detail on this figure, but all this really means is, you know, over the last 2000 years, once we got to about 1900, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere started to skyrocket, increase exponentially. Um, and in fact, this figure is even a bit dated now. The concentration of carbon dioxide has actually exceeded 400 uh, parts per million. Uh, we haven't seen this for 21 million years. So it's not a natural cycle we're dealing with. It's a man-made issue. And in fact, it's projected to go up to 1,000 ppm parts per million by the end of the century. Um, the oceans have done us a great ecosystem service in a way, and they've uh, absorbed approximately 30% of the CO2. But as a result, that's dropped the pH, increasing ocean acidification. The other thing, too, is all this greenhouse gas traps energy, thermal energy in the atmosphere. And the plot below, you don't need to worry too much about the units on the, on the vertical axis. But basically, around the same time, we got all those gases, we started trapping all this, all this energy. And all this energy translates mostly into heat. And the oceans come to the rescue again. They've absorbed about 90%, over 90% of that increase of thermal energy um, from the climate system. But of course, you know, the oceans as big as they are, they do, you know, start to react to this and thus increases in temperature. This is more or less what's happening now. What happens next? Prediction, the future. Future scenarios um, are basically set up by a couple of different uh, simulations. They're called uh, relative concentration pathways that describe different future mission scenarios. You'll see this, you know, you are here sign, which is, you know, roughly around 2021. Um, RPC 2.6 is the, you know, we get our act together, we cut our emissions close to zero. Uh, we can expect air temperature increase to about 1.6 degrees by 2050. And if we, and if everything is down, we stay that way, you know, till the end of the century. The less rosy scenario is 8.5, which is kind of where we're heading right now. Um, two degrees increase probably by the end of 2050. And then by the end of the century, 4.3 degrees air temperature increase on average, uh, which is disastrous. Um, and in fact, we've probably missed the boat on RPC 2.6. Uh, research recently said there's really enough emissions in the atmosphere now that we're probably not going to escape the 2%, the 2 degree um, warming by 2100. Okay, that's on the air. What does this mean for the oceans? Uh, just a really quick summary here. If we look at uh, translating into say relative biomass in the ocean, and I chose this one because we're about you know, fisheries and aquaculture here. Um, if you look across the bottom going from the different uh, scenarios from 2.6 to 8.5, um, by the end of the century, we lose the most biomass, of course, with the largest amount of emissions. And as you start moving up the food chain from net primary productivity, phytoplankton, zooplankton, higher trophic levels, the loss in biomass is even greater. So it's not, it's not good for the um, surface terrestrial area, but it's not great for the oceans, uh, clearly. The other thing that we should note is the climate models were right. What I mean by that is the challenge with prediction models is the weight to validate them. So when a lot of these models first came out, people said, well, it's just a model. We don't know if it's really that accurate. Well, guess what? There's now been enough climate change now to assess some of these models. Even 50-year-old climate models correctly predicted global warming. And out of um, uh, Hans Father uh, put out a at all put out a paper this year, and they did uh, looked at ten different forecasts, historical forecasts, and there was no statistically significant difference between their output and historic observation. So something to consider now that um, you know, well, models are predictive in nature. I mean, you know, the approach has been reasonably well validated. 
Okay, well, how has Canada done on emissions reduction? I mean, us ultimately want what we want to do, not just Canada, everybody, but let's look at Canada here. Kyoto Protocol, 1998, aimed to reduce emissions by 6% by, 19, by uh, 2012, not achieved. In fact, we increased it by 30%. Copenhagen Accord, 17% reduction by 2020, jury still out, target likely unachieved. And then the Paris Agreement, tried to uh, reduce our emissions to, to maintain below two degrees, Canada likely to miss the 2030 Paris targets by a really wide margin. Not so great. What about at a provincial level, Nova Scotia? In 2015, Nova Scotia surpassed the provincial target of 25% electricity from renewables and may have actually reached 40% by the end of 2020, still compiling the data. In 2007, uh, we passed the Environmental Goals and Sustainability Prosperity Act and that was replaced by the Sustainable Development Goals Act in 2019. And this act set new goals for um, climate change and uh, environment economy requires Nova Scotia to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 53% by 2030 to reach net zero emissions by 2050. It's the most ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction target in Canada right now. Uh, Nova Scotia has emerged as a leader in delivering energy efficiency programs and for initiating programs to help municipalities adapt to the impacts of climate change. So the gold star in the refrigerator for Nova Scotia. If we actually go and start looking at the changes that we should be tracking or concerned about in the ocean, what are they? Uh, most of you, again, are probably familiar with this, but just short list, temperature, ocean acidification, stratification, dissolved oxygen, salinity, ice cover, wave height, storminess. Yep, storminess. That's intensity, duration, and frequency curves for you engineers. Seasonal timing, so what? That's, a, that's not a, a comprehensive list, that's just some of the main ones. So what does that mean? How do we understand the impact of these changes? Well, a couple of things we need to understand, how much of a change are we talking about? The averages are really only partially informative. We need to know extremes, duration, frequency, et cetera. What are the rates? Are things happening fast or are they happening slow? Uh, when and where? Uh, spatially, temporally? Um, an average change out in the middle of the ocean isn't going to be really that informative for maybe what's happening in your little area of the coast you're concerned. And also interaction with other drivers. A lot of these things on the left-hand side are happening simultaneously, and, and some of them interact with each other. So it makes it a little bit tricky to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, Dr. Blair Green's talk is going to talk a little bit more about some of these physical changes. And of course, the other thing is, how do organisms respond to these changes, and how do we figure this out? An organism's response to a climate change stressor will be a function of where the change occurs relative to their optimal ranges and tolerance and the limits of life stage and physical process. This is where it gets complicated because different life stages have different tolerances, different physiological processes have different tolerances as well. What is the average magnitude of the stressor over the lifespan of the organism? What is the stress rate of change? Uh, the variation, frequency, duration, and magnitude of the extremes. Sometimes it's not the average that gets you, it's these extreme events. Epigenetic expression, genetic strain, and variation within and between populations. I've seen studies where the same species reacts two very different ways because they're different populations. What is the health and nutrition state of the animal? They can mitigate some of these effects in good health and nutrition, but that's not the case if, if they're not. Again, simultaneous stressor occurrence, and this is a really tricky one. The effects of simultaneous stressors will frequently interact, but may not be fully additive or synergistic. So we're going to maybe modeling the effect of one stressor, but once we start to get multiple stressors in there, it's really difficult and not, not impossible to model at our stage of understanding. And uh, stay tuned for Jenny Corris. So she's going to be talking about one of these biological responses, which is harmful algal blooms. Sorting out climate change involves almost all disciplines and massive amounts of information. There are now hundreds of thousands of scientific research publications related to climate change, and these numbers are doubling every five to six years. That's really encouraging because we're actually learning stuff, but it's also overwhelming. Even for experts in the field, it's a real struggle to stay on top of this information. Some of the disciplines involved in climate change, you know, they're all over the place. Just a couple examples here. Physics, chemistry, genetics, economics, psychology, biology, governance, ecology, law, health, hydrology safety and security, actuarial science, that's like calculating risk. Um, it's really easier to say like what disciplines actually don't fall under the climate change umbrella at this stage. All of these fields have relevance to Nova Scotia seafood under a changing climate. 
So as a researcher trying to figure out what's going on, this presents a number of different challenges. The overlap of multiple disciplines and simultaneous climate change drivers presents huge logistical challenges for research. I'm just going to do an example of a traditional biological experiment that somebody might do in tanks, just as an example. Modeling is a great discussion, but that's for another day. It's only basic usefulness if we remove an animal from its environment, place it in a tank, and crank up the temperature and CO2 to see what happens. Is that how it would be exposed under climate change? Probably not. We need to understand how the environment is changing to set realistic conditions and ranges for these experiments. We also need to account for the things I mentioned previously, life stages, different stressor levels, opportunity for genetic expression, nutrition, population differences, stressor interactions, and so forth. There's a lot going on. And just an example of um, uh, the multiple stressor one is a tough one because we can't really predict that well. If you actually try to run an experiment with multiple stressors, let's look at a relatively straightforward example. Uh, this complex experimentation, a multifactorial study, if you're looking at three stressors with three different levels, and let's say you need to have three replicates per treatment to make it scientifically robust, that's 81 culture units. How many facilities have this many identical culture units? What happens if the animal is large? You can probably do it if you're studying something like guppies and can use aquarium, but if you start looking at broodstock sized salmon, maybe, hell of it, forget it, you're not going to be able to do it. Can this research monopolize tank space for the animal's life stage? Remember I was saying we need to look at all these life stages. I mean, if the animal you know, takes two years to grow to an adult, then that's a long time to run an experiment. So there's some really big logistical concerns. Um, another thing we need to consider is um, the difference between mitigation and adaptation. And I use just an analogy here as climate change as a runaway freight train. Adaptation is stepping out of the way. Mitigation is actually trying to stop the train, which is probably a lot harder. Adaptation is a great short-term strategy, but without mitigation, the train keeps coming back faster, more frequent. Even if we put on the brakes, the train isn't gonna stop right away. We need both mitigation and adaptation, and these are the things we should consider in long-term plans. If we start looking at what we can do, in fact, in some ways, it's maybe a little bit easier to do adaptation. One of the ways we can um, figure out what we actually need to do is to do a vulnerability assessment. Uh, determining vulnerability to climate change effects, we can execute planned adaptation instead of reactive and usually more costly coping responses. Uh, vulnerability can apply to the ecosystem level as well as the community and sector level of the populace. So you really need three things typically, exposure risk, uh, measures how much community sector or resource will be impacted by future climate stressors, sensitivity, um, you know, how will community or sector be affected by climate change based on socioeconomic factors, it's related to levels of resource dependency, and adaptive capacity, how much will community or sector, um, what's your capacity to adjust to respond to this, and that includes all sorts of things like perception of risk and so forth, and that's what we use to calculate vulnerability. And in fact, uh, Dr. Mills is going to be doing a talk a little bit about some of the work done uh, south of the border. Um, Center for Marine Applied Research, uh, we've just finished up putting the finishing touches on the white paper on assessing uh, climate change uh, vulnerability of seafood in industry dependent communities in Nova Scotia. Um, we're hoping to get that posted within the next couple of weeks, so, uh, so stay tuned for that. So I'm coming to my last slide here. We need all hands on deck, which again, isn't surprising for those of us who kind of work in the area. You know, no single entity has resources or knowledge to quantify all possible climate change drivers and exposures, how we or the ecosystem will respond or how to adapt to or mitigate climate change. Advancements in our understanding and resilience require a combination of traditional data collections, like the empirical work example I showed you, modeling and field observations with a hefty dose of dialogue. This means extensive coordination and communication by scientists, fishers, aquaculturists, governments, NGOs, citizens, basically all of us. And the immortal words of the red green, we're all in this together. And thank you very much for your time. And that's my timer, right on 15 minutes. So thanks very much. I just have to figure out how to shut it off now. Um, so thanks very much. Uh, we could um, hold our questions until the end. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to transition over to uh, Blair. I think uh, you're able to share your screen. I think. Thanks, Gregor. Um, so the uh, 
I'm going to talk uh, about what our, what our state of knowledge of climate change is uh, and try and focus that on uh, Atlantic Canada and, and Nova Scotia where I can. That'll be the majority of the talk. I'm going to touch a little bit on uh, monitoring and, and research uh, we do in support of climate change in uh, at DFO. And, and then I'm going to finish with just a, a key take home message, I think, from, from the presentation. So in 2019, the Council of uh, Canadian Academies uh, produced a, a report called Canada's T Top Climate Change Risks, in which they looked at uh, 12 major risk areas for uh, Canada. Those are listed over on the right-hand side of the slide here. And this expert panel uh, uh, listed six uh, areas, top areas of, of climate risk. Uh, those are listed in the red text on the left-hand side. And if you read through those, you'll see that uh, five of the six directly relate to uh, coastal and fishing communities in Nova Scotia. Uh, so uh, through this risk assessment, uh, there's a strong indication that climate change uh, is a high risk for our, our um, coastal communities in Nova Scotia, and there will be a need to uh, address that going forward. Also in 2019, the government of Canada re, uh, released uh, Canada's Changing Climate Report. Uh, I was the lead author on the oceans chapter for that report. And so I'm just gonna go through sort of an overview of the output of this, uh, the key messages from this report um, and uh, just try to uh, tailor some of that messaging to, to Nova Scotia where I can. And the first key message is that, uh, both the past and future warming in Canada is on average about double the magnitude of global warming. Uh, the map on the right uh, hand side of your slide there shows the mean annual temperature increase from 1948 to 2016. You will see that there is spatial variability across Canada and, and indeed in Northern Canada, <clears throat> the rate of uh, warming over that time period is, is actually uh, three times the global uh, average. And much of this warming uh, over that period can be directly attributable to uh, human activities and, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, these, uh, these effects of this widespread warming are evident in many parts of Canada. Uh, there's just a few examples on, on the right-hand side of the slide here where we see thinning uh, and retreating uh, land-based glaciers in Canada. And we're observing changes in uh, and stream flow timing and magnitude. There's a number of other areas I'm going to touch on throughout the presentation that uh, that this warming is is impacting, and one of those <clears throat> is on precipitation. Uh, precipitation is projected to increase for most of Canada, and historically we see that that's already happen happening. From the the plot on the upper right panel here is shows you. Changes in, in annual precipitation averaged over all of Canada from the late 1940s uh, to uh, 2016. And you will see that there's uh, an increasing trend of precipitation annually. Now, one thing to note is as the climate is warming, uh, we're experiencing less of that precipitation as snow and more as rainfall. And of course, as we continue to warm the climate, that trend of less snowfall and more rain uh, will continue into the future. On the lower right, <clears throat> uh, there's a, a bar chart for Atlantic Canada for the end of this century, what the projection will be in terms of precipitation. Uh, the blue bars are for a low emission scenario that uh, Gregor mentioned uh, in, in his presentation. And then the gray bars are a, a high emission scenario. So you see for annual average uh, precipitation. Under a low emission scenario, we're seeing about a 5% increase for Atlantic Canada and a 12% increase in annual precipitation under the high emission scenario. We'll just jump over to the right-hand side of that plot and you see we're looking at extreme 24-hour precipitation, so these sort of extreme events that happen. And under a low emission scenario, we're, we're project, the projection is for about a 9% increase uh, in those extreme events, but under a high emission scenario, 
a 33% increase. So a very substantial increase in extreme precipitation events. Now I've talked a lot about increases in precipitation to this point, but there are some areas, uh, there will be some seasonal variability and there are some areas that in Southern Canada that may ex uh, experience a decrease in some uh, areas in the summertime. So that sort of uh, leads into um, what we know about and are projecting for seasonal avail availability of fresh water. Because of the uh, warmer winters and earlier uh, snow melt, if you look at uh, the schematic in the lower right, uh, it's just a, a concept of what's uh, happening and will happen in the future. We'll see that uh, we'll experience a higher uh, winter stream flows in our rivers because of that earlier melt. And that will reduce that peak stream flow that occurs typically in the spring. Also, because of our warmer summers, you'll see that that green line in the summer period in the future is reduced relative to what we've experienced in the past because of enhanced precipitation and though that lower uh, peak spring, uh, uh, stream flow. So there, there will be areas where there's uh, uh, shortages of uh, freshwater supply in, in, in the summer period. Now, probably of more interest uh, to this audience is uh, what will happen with sea ice in, the, in uh, Atlantic Canada. So we have already been seeing that in the Arctic and uh, Eastern Canada that we're experiencing longer and more widespread sea ice free conditions in, in the winter period. Uh, that's shown in the upper right panel here, uh, here where the red colors, uh, the deep red color off uh, East, Eastern Newfoundland indicates a uh, quite a strong uh, decreasing uh, sea ice concentration over uh, the past five decades. The Gulf of St. Lawrence is also experiencing a, uh, a decreasing trend in sea ice uh, and uh, not quite as strong as off Newfoundland, but still significant. And the, the graph in the lower right just shows you the, whole, the sea ice area for all of Atlantic Canada from 1970 to present. So there is a decreasing trend of about 7% uh, per decade in terms of sea ice area. You will note that there's strong variability from year to year in this type of time series. And there's also some strong natural variability in the climate, which shows up in signals you see in the 1980s and 90s um, that, uh, that sort of mask the long-term uh, climate trend. And that's one reason why it's important to monitor the environment for a long time period so that we can uh, increase our confidence about how these long-term trends are, are, are occurring. So, you know, areas of Nova Scotia that typically experience winter sea ice, like in the Northumberland Strait and, and uh, the western, um, uh, western part of Cape Breton, uh, will uh, experience, experience less and less sea ice as we move into the future uh, under a warming climate. As Gregor also mentioned, you know, we're seeing that oceans around Canada have warmed. Uh, there's an example of that in the lower right-hand panel here uh, with temp ocean temperature for the Bay of Fundy. You can see that the long-term trend in that record uh, indicates an increase of about one and a half degrees in the Bay of Fundy over the last hundred years. Again, you see variability from year to year and some strong decadal variability that shows up in these time series. But that trend from 1970 uh, uh, forward, you know, there's a strong confidence that uh, uh, most of that signal is related to human emissions of greenhouse gases. And as well as we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, some of that gets transferred into the ocean and it reacts with seawater to increase the acidity of seawater or decrease the pH. And as well as we warm ocean water, it's less able to uh, dissolve oxygen in it. So this combination of warming the ocean, uh, changing the uh, acidity and changing the uh, uh, oxygen content certainly could uh, threaten marine ecosystems. In terms of sea level change, uh, the uh, plot on the right-hand side here shows you the projections for sea level uh, change in, in Eastern Canada. 
at the end of the century under a high emission scenario. The, uh, what's evident here is that from the red dots uh, in Nova Scotia that we're, that this area of Canada is actually gonna ex experience the largest uh, relative or local sea level rise uh, in Canada. And the projection is for that uh, change to be in the range of 75 to 100 centimeters. So this will definitely increase the frequency of coastal flooding uh, that we experience going forward. And, uh, and that of course will have strong impacts on our coastal infrastructure and the east and coastal ecosystems. Now our, our warmer climate will intensify some weather extremes. Uh, we have pretty good confidence in knowing that, uh, in, in being able to state that we will see uh, increased heat waves and uh, an increased chance of, of wildfires uh, because of this increased um, heating of the environment. And as well, because of those increased uh, intense extreme precipitation events, uh, uh, there's an increased probability of urban flooding uh, uh, being quite significant. In terms of what we're gonna see in the ocean, uh, what the plot on the right here shows you is ocean bottom temperature change projected uh, by the middle of the century. Uh, the color bar on the on the bottom here shows you uh, the scale of uh, of this change, and in general, you can see over most of this region, uh, we the the ocean bottom temperature is projected to change by about a, at least a, a one degree, but in some of the deeper areas of the Scotian Shelf and the Gulf of Maine, that change could be as much as three degrees, and of course, this will have uh, uh, significant impacts on uh, habitat, habitat suitability for certain species that uh, occupy the bo ocean bottom. So the rate and magnitude of climate change uh, under a high versus low emission scenario really projects for two very different futures for Canada. Uh, and so the choices that society makes will have a significant impact in how this plays out over the coming century. If we look uh, at Atlantic Canada, um, the, uh, again, the blue bars here are for a low emission scenario uh, and the gray are for a high emission scenario going forward. And on the left-hand side, you see the annual average temperature in Atlantic Canada being limited to about two degrees Celsius under a low emission scenario, whereas that would be increased to about five degrees under a high emission scenario. Now, in terms of the highest annual daily maximum, uh, the, those changes are very similar to the annual averages. But one striking feature um, is that in the uh, third panel here, third part of the plot, is the lowest annual daily minimum. We see under a high emission scenario that the lowest annual daily minimum increases by 11 degrees. That means that our, our uh, nighttime temperatures in Atlantic Canada will be much, much warmer under a high emission scenario and will have, uh, of course, have uh, significant impacts uh, in our wintertime um, temperatures. And then the last of this is the number of hot days annually. Those are those days where the human X value gets uh, very uncomfortable. Under a, a low emission scenario, we don't see a very significant change in this in Atlantic Canada. Um, but under a high emission scenario, uh, that would increase by about 12 days annually. Now, in terms of DFO, uh, what are we doing in, in terms of climate change research? Well, we do have a number of long-term ocean monitoring programs that support our climate change science assessments and research. Uh, the most prominent of those is our Atlantic Zone Monitoring Program. Of course, we have uh, fisheries surveys that the department undertakes uh, to support stock assessments and that feeds into some of our uh, fisheries vulnerability uh, research. We do have a dedicated climate change science program uh, called ACAST that supports short-term uh, projects uh, on research and development, development of adaptation tools. And these, are, these tools are to assist uh, managers within our operational sectors in DFO to incorporate climate change into their planning. One example of, of that is I've uh, worked quite closely with small craft harbors in uh, developing tools for them to in, incorporate uh, sea level rise into their planning for harbors, harbor infrastructure upgrades 
uh, such as the breakwaters and wharves. So three areas that we focus on uh, in terms of research is really on acidification and changes in ocean oxygen. Also looking at vulnerability of our fisheries to climate change as well as coastal infrastructure and trying to improve our ocean models so that we get better, can do provide better projections of future changes in our ocean climate. So the, uh, the key um, take home message I'd like to provide you with today is I think really that coastal adaptation, uh, Gregor talked about mitigation and adaptation. Uh, coastal adaptation planning really is needed regardless of which future greenhouse gas emission pathway we follow as a society. There will be changes uh, in our oceans. They will become warmer uh, and likely more acidic. Uh, sea, level, uh, sea level change or increase will rise and sea ice will be reduced. And all of these things will have impacts that uh, we as a, a, a communities in Nova Scotia really need to uh, incorporate into our planning for the future. That's, that's it for me, Gregor. Great, uh, thanks very much Blair for that informative talk, much appreciated. Uh, for those of you who've just joined us, um, there'll be opportunity for questions at the end of this session. Uh, now we're gonna move over to um, Dr. Kathy Mills from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. So take it away, Kathy. Okay, you're good to go. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, Blair did a fabulous job of really setting up the context for climate change in Canada and in the Maritimes region. And I'm here with you today um, to try to sort of bring some insights into potential impacts of climate change on fisheries, and particularly to think about adaptation at a community scale for fishing communities. I am from Maine and most of my work focuses in the Gulf of Maine and further south, but I hope that some of the approaches we're using might be insightful and relevant to the conversations that are happening in Nova Scotia. So I want to, um, I want my slides moved. <laughs> All right, so um, I want to start just, um, Blair has really given us a great overview of the physical changes that are expected as climate change progresses. But I wanted to offer just one additional perspective on this, which is um, how the region in terms of ocean warming in our region compares um, to other areas of the world. And I think this really highlights that this region is at the forefront of experiencing change and we'll need to also be at the forefront of planning for and adapting to that change. So this um, map shows warming rates of ocean surface temperatures around the globe. And essentially the things that are showing up in yellow are portions of the world's oceans that are warming faster than 95% of the other pixels um, on the map. And so what you see here along the east coast of the US and right here along the uh, Nova Scotia coast as well. Since we have started collecting satellite sea surface temperature data back in 1982, this region has been warming exceptionally rapidly, including the whole Northwest Atlantic up into the Arctic. Also though, as we look forward, the projections that we see from climate models indicate that our region will continue to be experiencing really rapid warming relative to other portions of the world. Along with the strong warming trends, we're seeing changes in seasonality and more frequent heat waves. So this manifests in a variety of different forms. And it extends into the biological system in terms of creating um, changes across the ecosystem and for a number of marine species that exist in that ecosystem. Um, we've seen changes in distribution and productivity of populations, the timing of life history events like migration and spawning, the way that species interact with one another, as well as um, concerns about disease and pathogens emerging that particularly can be important in fisheries and aquaculture. So just to kind of give you some quick highlights of some of these changes, um, across many species and fish stocks, we are seeing consistent documentation of spatial distribution shifts. So this just shows one example of silver hake, which used to exist off of the, uh, at the shelf break along the mid-Atlantic coast in the US. Um, this is a, a map of survey results 
from the uh, 1968, and this pattern existed through the 70s as well, um, where there's a concentration further south than in current day conditions, we're seeing silver hake in the Gulf of Maine as its uh, primary location. And this pattern holds for many species as we see fish and marine invertebrates moving poleward and to deeper depths to track the temperatures they prefer. We're also seeing changes in productivity of a number of commercially important species. In the Gulf of Maine, we've related um, temperature or warming to declines in the productivity of Gulf of Maine cod and its successful recruitment and survival. We've also seen temperatures reach levels where northern shrimp no longer successfully reproduce in the Gulf of Maine. And we have contrasting stories for our US lobster populations where in southern New England, Temperatures have warmed to a level that is stressful and is impairing recruitment of lobster, but in the Gulf of Maine, temperatures actually have warmed into a zone that's actually very conducive for growth of the population in the past, um, in the recent past. And so it's benefited the lobster population and fishery in the Gulf of Maine. So I want to focus most of my talk on um, how we might think about these impacts at very local levels, um, thinking about really going from a global perspective on climate change to what it means for individual fishing communities along our coast. And the work I'm going to be sharing today really tries to hone in on a couple of core questions, which is um, first, how will fishing communities be affected by changes in species availability, so shifts of species associated with warming is the particular focus we're taking in this work. And secondly, what adaptation strategies are of interest to some of the stakeholders in these communities and how can we think about those moving forward? So to start with the first question of impacts at a community level, we are conducting coupled social ecological vulnerability assessments for fishing communities along the Northeast coast from Maine down to North Carolina. And in this, what we really try to understand is how change, uh, climate driven change in the ecosystem affects local communities through their resource use patterns and what that means when it's put together as a whole. So we have conducted this analysis um, using two climate scenarios, the 4.5 and 8.5 scenarios looked at a, several different perspectives on those to try to capture variability within those scenarios and made projections out to 2055 and 2100. For the results I present today though, just to keep it as simple as possible, I'm gonna focus on just the mean 8.5 scenario projected to mid-century 2055. The so first step in considering uh, coupled social and ecological vulnerability requires understanding the potential ecological impact. So we look at ecological impact from um, an approach that considers changes in species biomass within an area that's relevant to the community, which we call the community's fishing footprint. And fishing footprints essentially reflect where uh, fish that are being landed in that port are actually being caught at sea. So what portion of the ocean is particularly important to landings in a certain place? This gives you one example for Portland, Maine, where most of the catch that's landed in Portland would be coming from. So we can then consider these areas and we have species models that um, look at how species distribution has changed in the past and project it forward with warming temperatures to understand how we expect species to change from a baseline period, which we um, looked at 2011 through 2015 for, and then projected out to the future. So here I'm showing one example with American lobster for the fall. Um, we have an understanding or a model of its current baseline biomass, a projection to the future, and then can look at change in where lobster may be and its relative biomass. And we see as we look towards the middle of the century, we are projecting declines in lobster in the Southern Gulf of Maine and out on Georgia's bank but potential increases in, or an increased concentration of biomass in the eastern portion of the main coast and Bay of Fundy area. And right now we are working from models that are specific to US waters, but are developing a new suite of projections that will extend up into the Canadian waters as well. So the second portion of a vulnerability assessment for fishing community requires considering how the community um, might be impacted socially from changes in the species. And we do this by looking at what communities are actually 
relying on to support their fisheries. So what is being landed in those ports in particular? And when we take the approach of considering landings in a particular port, we can then um, put together species that are relevant to that port and look at the changes that we have projected that I just shared with you for some of the species that are most important in a given community. So this is one example from Portland where we see some of the, um, a huge portion of the value of landings in this port is coming from lobster, Atlantic herring, and then the, um, the groundfish complex. So we see a lot of blue in this figure and blue is associated with declines in those particular species. So when we put this together across these species, we expect there to be overall declines in the, um, in the commercial mix of species that's being landed in Portland. But we see contrasting results in other locations. So this is um, showing you some of the species that are currently being landed and are important to fisheries in Point Judith, Rhode Island. And in Point Judith, which is uh, down south of Cape Cod, we see that a number of species that are supporting fisheries there, like scup, longfin squid, summer flounder, are showing up in the orange color, which means they are projected to increase in the future. We do see declines in other species like lobster and groundfish herring as well in Point Judith, but much more of a mixed result and much more of an overall positive result um, in terms of potential future opportunities within species that are already currently landing um, in that port. So when we put this together across the whole region, we see quite a lot of blue along the coast of Maine reflecting overall declines in the mix of species currently being landed in particular ports. And a lot of this is obviously associated with our projections for American lobster given its importance in Maine fisheries. But then south of Cape Cod, much more of a mixture of results with blues, lighter blues, some oranges and some lighter pink colors showing up. So much more um, diverse outcomes showing up south of Cape Cod for fishing communities there. And the last piece of this though, is once we understand how a community might be affected by changes in species they harvest, we also need to consider whether they have the capacity to adapt to those changes. We do this by bringing into, um, into our analysis a couple of different perspectives on adaptive capacity. The first is, will there be new opportunities in the future? So climate change might bring about change, which may mean shifts from some of the species that they are currently harvesting, but will there be new species that create new opportunities showing up in waters that are um, being fished by boats from those communities. So we do see also quite a lot of variability in the potential for emerging species along the coast. In Portland and in many of our main um, ports, we see quite a number of species that are potentially going to be available and um, harvestable in the future that are not currently being caught in fisheries there. And further south, like in Point Judith, relatively few species that are not, um, not being harvested at this point in time. We also consider general um, ability of the community to adapt to change by looking at their social characteristics and their dependence on fisheries. And we are able to support this portion of the analysis because NOAA has conducted a social, has developed indicators of social vulnerability across the country for all of our fishing communities, essentially. So we're, it's a great resource to be able to draw upon. And then I just wanna give you one way that we have put this information together. In this figure, I've plotted our 120 communities by the change that we are projecting in the relative biomass of species they're currently harvesting against their social vulnerability. And it, uh, I'm not gonna go into detail on these results, but essentially we can use information like this to prioritize sets of communities where we expect to, um, to see declines in the species they're currently dependent on and to see potentially high social vulnerability that might indicate a greater need for a focus on adaptation planning and support um, information for those communities. So the last question I'm just gonna run through and touch on briefly is adaptation strategies that 
fishing um, stakeholders and municipal officials are thinking about in fishing communities. So we glean these strategies from interviews and workshops that we conducted in four focus communities, Stonington, Maine, Portland, uh, New Bedford, Mass, and Point Judith, Rhode Island. And what we heard is that people are already thinking about a wide variety of adaptation strategies from industry actions like changes in how they handle products, um, supply chain capacity, as well as marketing efforts to increase value under the potential um, for decline in volume. We're seeing fishermen thinking already about changing fishing locations and changing the target species um, that they catch. And these are coping strategies that have historically been really important for our fishing industries to adjust to changes in the past. They're also thinking about diversifying activities, both within fishing uh, to a broader mix of species they might target and activities outside of wild harvest fisheries. And then also local seafood as a potential avenue to building local markets and um, supporting, supporting or providing pathways for new species that may not be viable at large scale. Um, and so I just wanna wrap up with, after giving you a few of those insights, um, from those interviews, we also heard about a number of challenges people are concerned about that are really important for us to consider as well. So one is, um, I guess one of the takeaways is that fisheries may change in the future, but there may, there will likely be opportunities that emerge that don't exist today that could provide new avenues for fisheries as we move forward. But these um, changes mean that future fisheries may look different from today's fisheries. So one of the challenges is just social acceptance and being able to adjust through those changes. We also heard a lot of um, discussion of regulatory and financial barriers. So clearing those hurdles will be important for supporting adaptation. And I really wanna call attention to the fact that we might think about adaptation within, um, within fisheries, within the fishery management process, but at a community level, it's also really important to think beyond fisheries themselves to the shoreside infrastructure, transportation networks, and markets that support fisheries. And Blair and his colleagues have done some great work bringing sea level rise into vulnerability assessments. So I'm just going to wrap up um, by saying that we know that our mitigation efforts will shape long-term outcomes, but reinforcing Gregor's message, adaptation will still be necessary in the near term. Adaptation can play out across multiple actors at multiple scales from individual actors into communities and into management agencies. So coordinating those efforts and ensuring that they all support the ability to adapt will be really important. We heard a lot about information needs for supporting adaptation planning at local community scales and also the need to ensure that broader conditions actually can enable adaptation, um, thinking particularly about responsive fishery management systems providing some scope for change within and beyond our fisheries, and then financing being particularly important for moving from ideas into actually implementation and action based on those ideas. So I will wrap up by acknowledging that this has been a large collaborative effort and uh, we've had a uh, good fortune to have funding from NOAA to support this and be happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Kathy. A great presentation. Um, we have one more uh, speaker, and then we have questions uh, after that uh, for everybody. A um, few panelists, there are a couple of questions uh, coming in, and I see that uh, Blair's tackled a few of them in the Q&A. Um, so if you want to get a head start, uh, by all means. Um, but uh, right now, we've got uh, Jenny Corris from Manovasi. So take it away, Jenny. Great, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, or morning, I suppose, depending on where you're tuning in from today. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks um, to everyone who had a hand in making this event happen this year. Um, I know it's transitioned into this virtual format, but I think it's been really well received so, um, so far, and it's been a really big success. Uh, so my name is Jenny Corris, and I'm an aquaculture scientist with Anova Sea, uh, and I'm excited to be here today to talk a little bit about um, the effects of climate change, specifically on um, harmful algae blooms and some of the impact this can have in ocean-based aquaculture. I also wanted to acknowledge that I'm giving this talk uh, from Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. 
So I'll just start by uh, introducing Innovacy uh, to those of you who might be unfamiliar with us. Uh, so our goal is to revolutionize aquaculture by combining technical know-how uh, with hands-on industry expertise to deliver innovative end-to-end -end solutions for aquaculture from egg all the way to harvest size, and whether that's on land uh, or in the open ocean. And so many of our tools and technologies are aimed at delivering precision aquaculture, a holistic uh, data-driven approach to fish farming that, that relies upon empirical evidence and analytics. So we specialize in three key areas, uh, land-based and open ocean operations, as well as intelligent aquaculture, uh, which provides the technology that allows for the real-time visibility uh, into all aspects of fish farm operations. So now that you have an idea of who we are and uh, what we do, I'll just start by putting the aquaculture industry um, into perspective, which uh, in a group like this is probably pretty common knowledge, um, but it really kind of frames the situation that we're in. So over the last 25 years, there has been this you know, huge increase in total fish production, but the proportion that's being produced by um, aquaculture has more than tripled over this period. And in 2018, farm products supplied 52% of the fish for human consumption. And so as our planet's uh, population continues to grow exponentially, there's this significant need to invest in sustainable food production now, um, and aquaculture is poised to meet some of this demand as it's currently the fastest growing food sector. And so we have to start to think about managing uh, some barriers to its continued growth. Uh, and so aquaculture production that occurs in our oceans is at the mercy um, of its natural phenomenon, which can act as some of these barriers. And so harmful algae blooms or HABs are one of these phenomenon that are currently causing major issues for ocean farmers um, all over the world. So I'll just go through uh, what are HABs. Uh, so algae or phytoplankton are these naturally occurring microorganisms that support our ocean's food web. However, under the right conditions, their populations can grow exponentially or bloom uh, in a very short period of time. And this can have negative consequences to some of the surrounding organisms. These blooms will typically occur in the spring and in the fall when there are these increased light levels, there's upwelling, which brings nutrients to the surface, uh, and these warmer temperatures, which can enable faster growth rates. So during a bloom, uh, algae can completely deplete the oxygen in an area, and even more so as the bloom dies off and bacteria decomposes the dead uh, organic matter. And some species of phytoplankton will produce these neurotoxins, and these can harm or even kill fish directly. Other uh, species have these mechanical structures like barbs or spines. And so when they're in higher concentrations, these can get caught um, and damage fish's gills, uh, which can affect their ability to take up oxygen from the water. And so these blooms um, are occurring primarily in coastal regions where many farms are situated. And so it's for this reason uh, that many farmers will invest a significant amount of time and effort uh, into monitoring plankton uh, in order to protect their livestock. So different species um, can be more concerning than others. Uh, as you can see here uh, in the table, uh, these are some of the species that can cause a significant amount of damage, uh, even in really low concentrations. So producers will use uh, different sampling methods, which can vary from really basic toe samples uh, with analysis under a microscope to some more high-tech methods uh, like flow cytometry, uh, or even using seaplanes with LIDAR technology to scan over larger regions. It's a significant amount of time and effort and a lot of valuable resources going to collecting, analyzing, and acting on this information uh, in really tight timelines. But when there's millions of dollars of fish on a farm, you know, you're going to do everything you can to protect that livestock. Uh, unfortunately, however, sometimes we get these kind of worst case scenario situations. Um, and that's exactly what happened uh, in 2016 uh, when one of the most catastrophic events in the history of aquaculture hit the Patagonia fjords in the south of Chile. And so this event um, actually comprised of two blooms back to back. Uh, so the first was a pseudo Chatonella bloom uh, in February, which saw concentrations as high as 20,000 cells per milliliter. And so this bloom caused the largest fish farm mortality that has ever been recorded. And the second bloom uh, occurred later into March uh, and April and was caused by a species Alexandrium cantonella, and so this species creates a toxin that's known as paralytic shellfish poison or PSP, and it affected over 200 shellfish farms um, throughout the region. And so if we dig a little deeper um, into this event, we can begin to understand how a bloom of this magnitude formed uh, and caused as much damage as it did. 
So first we can look to the expanding ranges that we've seen from both of these species over the last few decades. So Pseudoshetnella has been expanding southward while Alexandrium Campanella's range has been expanding northward to the point that they now both overlap. And this expansion of both species has caused um, similar, but uh, much smaller scale blooms in new areas uh, over the years. And not only that, but these blooms have been occurring more frequently than in years past. So on top of that, uh, this event occurred during a particularly strong El Nino event, as well as the positive phase of the Southern Annular Mode or the SAM. And these are two uh, really important climate drivers. So I'll just give you a brief uh, overview of how they work. So the SAM refers to the shifting of these strong westerly winds that are below the subtropical ridge in the Southern Hemisphere. And a positive SAM will push these winds further south and impacts things like rainfall, wind, and temperature in the surrounding areas. El Nino events have to do with a weakening or a reversal of the southern trade winds, and that will bring much warmer than normal waters to the Chilean coast. And so typically, El Nino conditions will enable or force the negative phase of the SAM. However, during this bloom, the SAM was at its highest positive phase. And the SAM is a sign of anthropogenic climate change, and it has been trending to have more positive events in recent years. So what this suggests is that climate change had a strong enough influence uh, to overcome the El Nino forcing. And it was the coordination of these two climate drivers that led to the exceptional water conditions that enabled these two species to bloom. And this was an extreme event, but these kinds of extreme events are mimicking potential future climate conditions. And so they help us to understand some of the drivers and the impacts of these events that may become more common in the future. And so while this might be um, you know, one of the most extreme cases of climate change driving algae bloom dynamics, it's certainly not an isolated one. Uh, so in Tasmania, which is another hotspot for climate change, we've seen this extension of the East Australian current due to increasing temperatures and salinities. And so in turn, this has expanded the range of a species called Noctiluca, which has been carried by this current. And so at one point, this was a rarely seen species, but now not only has its range increased, but it's one of the most uh, prominent red tide organisms in this area. And it's causing major issues for farmers in the region. Uh, another example was caused by the blob, uh, which is not the only life form from the 1950s horror movie. Uh, but in 2015, the blob was making headlines for other reasons. So in the US Pacific Northwest, uh, a giant bloom of Pseudomychia reached as far north as British Columbia. And so blooms in this region are common, but they're not usually dominated by a harmful toxin producing species such as this. And so there was this giant blob of warm water that had persisted in the area and is thought to be the reason why this species was able to dominate. And it's because the increased temperatures increased its growth rate. And climate model simulations and observations suggest that these marine heat waves in the North Pacific, uh, such as those that cause this abnormal warm water intrusion, may intensify with ongoing climate changes. So unfortunately, uh, everywhere we kind of look, the trends are the same. Climate change is impacting our oceans. The surface layers where phytoplankton live and bloom are the most heavily affected. Um, and this is going to lead to farmers um, encountering new, um, spe uh, new species due to changing and expanding ranges, more frequent uh, and extreme blooms, and longer plankton seasons. And so if anybody subscribes to any aquaculture news sites, you might have seen the headlines just a few weeks ago uh, that were pointed at another species, Lepidodinium chloroforum, which caused another significant bloom uh, in the region and caused a single company to lose 3% of their biomass. And I was speaking with a colleague of mine, um, and they think that it's these shifts that are occurring um, in the timing of their summer, which is causing maximum air temperatures to coincide with their heaviest rainfall season. And so this is bringing in excessive nutrients from a lot of the surrounding farmland um, and bringing these nutrients into the fjord where these farms are situated. But it's not all uh, doom and gloom. Uh, there are mitigation strategies and technology developments that can help us counter some of these losses. So the first step is we actually need to monitor uh, and record this environmental data before, during, and after have events um, on aquaculture farms. And improvements in remote monitoring capabilities um, that can capture you know, high frequency data with fine scale uh, spatial resolution can help inform farmers of baseline and changing conditions. And something I'll just quickly mention, but I'll talk about a little more later, um, is this opportunity that we have to incorporate 
uh, you know, really large data sets and frameworks that are already in place, like weather stations and satellite uh, chlorophyll and temperature data, and build tools that make this data accessible um, to farmers. And this could be a real game changer in HAB monitoring. I mentioned earlier, um, you know, this intensity of sampling routines of farmers who are monitoring for harmful algae blooms on their farms. Uh, and so as you can imagine, uh, this plankton data can get really uh, quite complicated quite quickly. You know, you have all of these different species and they're harmful at all of these different concentration levels and you're sampling in multiple different locations at multiple times of the day. And this is really critical data uh, to collect, but without any kind of structure to it, it's not really useful operationally and it's difficult to observe and analyze for trends over time. Uh, so this is a great time for me to mention uh, some new software that we've recently released to some of our clients that can help, um, help them manage their plankton data. So we developed this software directly with one of our customers. So it's really um, designed specifically with farmers in mind, and it enables them to store, analyze, and aggregate both algae and zooplankton measurements. Um, and there's this uh, intuitive map view, which allows for farm or regional managers to kind of quickly assess uh, where the highest plankton concentrations and the most toxic species exist uh, across multiple sites. Uh, and it also digitizes this data so that it's accessible um, anywhere in, in real time. In terms of mitigating against a bloom uh, once it's occurring, the use of aeration and oxygen injection systems is one technique that's becoming a lot more commonplace on a standard farm. Uh, and so by using a compressor and some special tubing with these diffusers, farmers can either create uh, a plume of bubbles that can help keep, keep the plankton out directly, or they can inject um, oxygen at depth to directly improve oxygen levels within individual pens. And so these systems typically have been controlled manually on site uh, and involve a lot of uh, messing with valves and pressure and airflow, um, and any adjustments will always require somebody on site. But we're actually currently in the process of testing the first um, digitally controlled uh, aeration and oxygen panel. And so this would allow for remote control of these systems using our software. And so while this might seem like a small and simple step forward, uh, it's when we consider the future of this kind of system that it gets kind of exciting. Because as you can imagine, when the valves can be controlled via software uh, instead of manually, then we can start to use the environmental data and the plankton data that's being collected uh, to provide feedback to this aeration system. And so this can really help improve the efficiency of plankton mitigation on aquaculture farms. But of course, um, these are kind of solutions to deal with algae blooms once they formed. Uh, so the question remains, how do we help those who are facing increased amounts of pressure uh, for more frequent and intense bloom threats uh, by providing them with better prediction capability. So I just wanted to highlight um, something that I recently came across. It's this training initiative from NASA, uh, which provides free educational material and methods on how to access and implement uh, remote sensing or satellite data uh, for a whole suite of applications. But they have four or five that are dedicated specifically for HAB monitoring. And in one of the sessions, um, they presented this case study uh, that's currently using ocean color data to provide these real-time bulletins um, of HAB forecasts for single species blooms of Karenia brevis in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and this species is known for producing this really signature um, red color. And so this initiative is helping to overcome uh, one of the major drawbacks of satellite data, which is this inability to detect at the species level, uh, which is required for farms to assess for toxicity. And so for anyone who's interested in this, um, I highly recommend watching um, all of the sessions, but this specific application kind of made me curious. And I, so I went looking to see if this is being done in any kind of aquaculture specific context. And it turns out that it is. So in a study that was just published uh, last year in 2020, uh, researchers were able to validate the ability uh, to use this uh, normalized chlorophyll anomaly data from the Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 satellites. Uh, to provide near real-time updates on the developments of another single species bloom um, that was occurring in Chile uh, last spring that was also causing uh, more fish mortalities on farms. And so the need for this data presented itself because site access was being limited by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And so site workers were unable to access their sites to take these plankton samples. Uh, but similar to the Karenia brevis example, there was this you know, intense green reflectance from this single species that was being measured 
uh, and used to track the bloom's growth and movement. And this species was Lepidodinium chloroforum, which if you remember is the same species that I mentioned earlier that was just in the news a few weeks ago. So I think there's a lot of potential uh, for hab monitoring and forecasting for aquaculture farms uh, using this satellite data. Uh, and I think this is a really interesting area of research. And so once we kind of figure out how to incorporate all of these different data streams together for HAB forecasting, uh, I think this will really help uh, tackle this kind of worsening problem of harmful plankton effects uh, in ocean farming. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, I've included my contact information uh, as well as a link to some additional resources uh, if you're interested in learning more. And I'll be happy to take any questions during the panel discussion. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, some great talks from all our panelists. We've got about uh, just under 15 minutes left. So um, as promised, there's an opportunity for questions. We did answer a couple of um, questions on the, um, open, uh, the open question forum. I'll just uh, cover them just so we don't have replicate because I just realized I think the panelists uh, can see them, but maybe not everybody. Um, somebody asked from my talk, uh, uh, I measure federal performance against the major international agreements such as Kyoto Paris, what is the Nova Scotia performance against these targets? Um, I don't have that information specifically. Margot Collin, who did that work in her presentation, might. Um, but I can say in Nova Scotia, uh, it, was, it was relatively, I think in the last 10 years, that this really sort of stepped up to the plate in terms of the emissions reduction. Uh, but maybe I'll uh, circle back to Margot in a minute if she has that question. Um, another question from Ryan McNara to... Um, Changes at Blair's presentation, the changes in sea level are though are these by the end of the century or earlier? Uh, Blair responded back, these are um, changes in sea level were for 2100 under high emission scenario. That was our RCP uh, 8.5. If you'd like to see changes from present 2100 in many coastal communities, uh, Nova Scotia, you can find it on the website. That, uh, any any lists um, uh, a link there for, for BIO. And then uh, uh, Ryan McNarma, 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 sorry, question for um, Catherine. Um, looking specifically at your data on Atlantic herring, you project a decrease in quantity landed off of Portland, Maine. Is this due to an overall decrease in fish population or simply a migration uh, northward? Are you able to address that, Kathy? Sure, I tried to reply to that, but I would be happy to address it verbally. Um, the uh, models that we're using is looking at relationships between habitat conditions, so environmental conditions and biomass that we have observed in the past. So they're built, they're statistical models built on past relationships. So when we project them forward, we drive them with changes in temperature, and that statistical relationship holds. Um, so these provide long-term indications of shifts in biomass that integrate changes in environmental conditions. So could could reflect northward movement, but could also affect uh, could also reflect higher or lower biomass levels associated with different environmental conditions. I would point out though they are not population models, so they are not building in biological processes, and therefore are not really usable at short time scales, like the time scales that we do have detailed population dynamic models for to support fisheries management. So they can be useful for planning, but not for sort of one to three year time frame understanding of population expectations. Hope that's helpful. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much, Kathy. Um, I'm gonna open up the uh, floor now and uh, maybe try to raise your hand. Adam LaDuke, our technical person, you might have to um, alert me to these. I'm not sure with the number of people here, I can see them all depending on how they're listed. Um, so does anyone have any questions for any of the, uh, any of the panelists or, or myself on the presentations you saw? Either I'm missing the hands or we got a quiet bunch. Uh, Gregor, Catherine Boyd asked me a question uh, in the Q&A session about um, sea ice off Labrador and why it was mm -hmm. changing. If I could just share my screen for a second, I tried to answer it in, in, the, uh, in the chat, sure. in the Q&A, but I, uh, I just want to show that that is a bit of a, an anomaly. Um, let's see. 
Can you see that? Yep. Okay, so if you look at this panel on the right, again, in Northern Labrador and up into Baffin Bay, uh, you're seeing, again, significant decreases in, in sea ice in this region, uh, trending downward. Uh, so that, that area in Southern Newfoundland where there's not statistically significant decrease is a bit of an anomaly that we don't really fully understand why that is. But uh, the picture we see off Eastern Newfoundland, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, is pretty consistent with what we're seeing in the rest of Eastern Canada, including Hudson Bay. Um, just wanted to, I just thought that maybe that figure might, uh, might uh, help uh, and, uh, explain that, uh, that change. Oh, thanks, Blair. That's great. Um, just checking for other messages. Oh, attendees are not able to participate at all. Sorry. Oh, they need to use a q and I'm sorry. I, the tech, I just got a message from tech support. So I uh, apologize. You can't raise your hand apparently if you're trying to. So you're going to have to type it into the Q&A. And here we go. Okay. They're coming in fast and furious. So um, we have one attendee which says, um, with the changes in ocean temperatures and phytoplankton, could we expect oyster growing rates like in the USA? Good question. I would say they're, uh, well, from my experience, oyster growing rates are more a function of the phytoplankton than the temperature. Um, so it would be a function of partly the phytoplankton availability. As to where that's trending in the coastal area, I don't have a good sense of that. Uh, you know, we've seen in the open ocean, there is a projection for, um, a bit of decrease in phytoplankton, also decrease in the size of phytoplankton, as I'm aware. I don't know, uh, Blair or Kathy, you have any information about, or or even Jenny, about uh, phytoplankton, uh, maybe in the coastal area and, and differences between, you know, the U.S. and moving up into Canada. You might have to get back to you on yeah, that one. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> really sure I could, uh, I could address that. Uh... Yeah. You know, sort of can't get you a clear answer, but um, we'll make a note of that. And and uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to one of us or myself. My contact information is there too. And I'll uh, if the answer exists, I can help find it for you. Um, Margot responded to the question earlier about uh, Nova Scotia's performance uh, relative to Canada. Um, she said Nova Scotia has performed better than other provinces in Canada's effort to meet international targets. However, Canada as a whole has not met international targets under these agreements. So. I think, uh, yeah, so yay for Nova Scotia. I don't have specific numbers in front of you, but certainly in the last decade, it has done very well. A uh, question from Les uh, Watling, a question for Kathy. Uh, do your data suggest that the fisheries along the East Coast will be more pelagic than benthic? All right, that's a great question, Les. Um, I would not say that we could draw that conclusion at this point, just because we have so many more benthic species in our surveys and uh, more reliable models for those benthic species. And so we do see, I would say, an increase in coastal species um, that are moving northward from the mid-Atlantic into the Gulf of Maine. And some of those like striped bass are pelagic. Um, but in terms of sort of our small pelagic complex, um, it's just not well represented enough, I think, in the suite of models that we have been relying on um, to know. We do see, you know, them shifting, but not to sort of assess the reliability of the overall mix. And we are moving into a new modeling framework. So hopefully we will then have models that we feel like are reliable for a larger number of those species in the next year or so. So thanks for the question. Okay. I have a question for our panelists, actually. Uh, I've always been curious. Um, uh, predominantly, a lot of the models for species distribution, you know, temperature is kind of one of the main parameters. Are we, uh, are we in a danger of relying on temperature too much to figure out what's going to happen? The only reason I mention this is um, 
the Audubon Society last year, they're all birds, of course, uh, because they have lots of people that observe birds. So you can get lots of data, uh, you know, basically found that uh, many of the bird species, uh, simply just uh, the range extension moving north uh, isn't going to help them because they get out of things they need for habitat, et cetera, or whatever, like other things are limiters. So I'm just wondering on the environmental side, if you're, uh, if fish species are being pushed to a different thermal uh, area moving north, um, you know, is there a possibility that they're not going to have, you know, the other things they need for habitat uh, to be a successful species? Like, are we, are we being kind of naive in our assumption that things are just going to kind of move forward? Uh, you know, I just have that open to anybody to answer because I was thinking about that the other day. Well, I can jump in if you want, but sure. um, I'll try to keep it short so others can jump in too. I would say certainly that is a limitation. Um, and we are starting to try to bring in a broader suite of environmental variables. And I think you see more and more studies that consider a broader suite of environmental variables. Um, I would say though, one of the, the biggest uh, limitations, I think, is the potential for predator prey mismatch. And the distribution models do not typically include biological factors, or you would be relying on a model of certain biological components of the system to then inform a model of another biological component. So models of prey informing models of predators. And they're there is some work moving in that direction, but typically, and we will be doing some work um, focused on lobsters as well as cod um, that moves in that direction. But typically you see that type of deep dive really done for a small number of species as opposed to this broad uh, view of a, a large suite of species and how they might be changing. So I hope that as things advance, um, there will be more growth in that arena to bring some of these um, ecosystem linkages that really matter a lot into consideration. Yeah, yeah, no, excellent uh, framing. And certainly um, anybody in the uh, fishing community who is aware of um, whales moving into locations where they haven't usually been before are pretty familiar with what um, can potentially happen when the prey and, uh, uh, prey and predator uh, interaction starts, starts to change. Um, how that could trickle down to all sorts of different spin-off effects that you wouldn't otherwise uh, anticipate. Great, thanks. Um, one question from uh, Greg, uh, Gregor. Oh, I might just ahead. say as well, oh, you, ahead, also, you, you also touched on in, in your uh, overview of, of multiple stressors. You know, we, we don't, a lot of times, don't account for changes in ocean acidification in these models. It's, it's simply, and how, what that impact would have, impact would have on the physiology of, of the species. You know, we're some, it's complicated enough to, to model, you know, the changes just with temperature and then adding in those other factors is not something that many people are addressing at this point. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. It's, just, it's a huge challenge. Uh, we have time for just one more question, uh, three minutes left. Um, thanks, uh, Blair. Uh, Tana Joga, if, if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. Um, any data on local changes in wild fish stocks or seawater quality related to seaweed aquaculture? Is this type of approach yet part of the adaptive strategy in Canada? Um, there are some people looking at uh, ranges of seaweed culture within different um, uh, thermal, uh, thermal areas and, um, and whether that's detrimental to certain species, because uh, likewise, uh, seaweed culture, uh, depending on the species, would potentially be moving forward as well. Um, I don't think it's part of an adaptive strategy yet in Canada, um, but uh, he's also mentioning local change in wild fish stocks or seawater quality related to seaweed aquaculture. Not sure I quite understand your question, but certainly the fish stocks, um, yet trying to account for that and their water quality to feed into all of these things. Um, a couple of people looking at seaweed culture, uh, but yeah, as far as I'm aware, it's not quite involved as an um, adaptive strategy. Um, one minute, uh, just for Jenny, another application for your research would be understanding the food safety risk, those wild, uh, those wild fisheries that uh, process at sea, uh, the offshore sector processes fish and market ready packages in some cases, shifting biotoxin risk will be an issue that needs consideration. Yep. Excellent point, uh, excellent point, Catherine. Um, all right, I think that's it. Um, 
we're going to bring this to a close. Uh, thanks everybody for your participation. It's one thirty. Um, our contact information is on the website, and uh, we will have um, um, uh, PDFs of our presentation uh, uh, posted up uh, shortly. Uh, so thanks very much for your time, and I appreciate uh, you spending it with us today. Have a great day. Thank you.